Hi guys, welcome to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago. I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. A couple of you guys have asked about my PhD, what I did in my thesis, how I kind of put it all together, and some reflections of my experiences that I think will help you guys out. So thanks for suggesting that. I'm going to talk you through that in this video. If that sounds good to you, give this video a big thumbs up. That really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't already, Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get notifications. Let's start with my path into my PhD. So I went straight from my undergrad in philosophy into my PhD. So at the end of my undergrad, I basically did the summer holidays and then I started my PhD the September afterward. That's pretty unusual. The usual thing to do was to do the undergrad and then a master's and then a PhD. And I think more or less nowadays you have to do that. I talked during my undergrad, the final year of my undergrad, to my potential supervisors. They were like, yep, we can we can take this guy straight away on his PhD. I guess I kind of thought at the time, like, if they would take me, then I should just do that straight away and skip the master's step. Maybe I kind of thought, yeah, I can be a bit of a smart ass. I can just, like, skip a year and go straight in at that level. I'm, I'm, I feel ready. That wasn't a very smart choice, I think, for me. Looking back on it, I think, you know, maybe I was ready, but that, that first year of the PhD was pretty tough. I had to do a lot of work to kind of get myself from undergrad level to PhD level pretty quickly. I think it would have been much better for me to have done the standard thing of doing the, the taught masters where you carry on doing classes and then you start doing a small thesis that kind of leads you into PhD study. I think that would have been a better option for me and I'm pretty much recommending it for everyone. Okay, so do your undergrad, then do a master's, then do your PhD. My PhD subject. Okay, so I did another pretty unusual thing. I did my undergrad in philosophy, but then I did my PhD in a computer science department. So really, I wanted to do my PhD on logic and I talked to my undergrad teachers and they said, well, there's nobody here that really could supervise you for logic, you know, at, at PhD level. But we know some people over in the computer science department who work on logic. So why don't you go and have a chat with them? So I did. And I registered in the computer science department. I did my PhD kind of jointly between the philosophy department and the computer science department. So I could kind of do a bit of teaching in both departments. But really, all of it was supervised in the computer science department. So it wasn't a complete change of subject. It was from philosophy to kind of logic, which is kind of related, but it, it was a change of environment. I kind of had been working in one department and during my PhD, I went and pretty much worked physically in the computer science department um, around computer scientists. Again, this is not something that I'm going to recommend to anyone. You know, there were some good things about it. I learned loads of really interesting things. I learned new ways of working. I learned um, new techniques and new areas of research. That was all really interesting, but it was super, super, super hard. Again, during that first year, I basically went into this subject at PhD level that I really knew very little about. And, and probably I looked like a bit of an idiot to most of the lecturers there because I just didn't know any of this basic stuff. The second reason why I think that was a pretty bad move is... By the end of my PhD, I'd done, you know, a bit of computer science and I'd done a bit of postgrad philosophy, but not really enough of either to be viewed as a real expert in either. So at the end of my PhD, I finished it. I was going to job interviews. I got job interviews in philosophy. I got job interviews in computer science departments. And the computer science people were like, mm, yeah, you know what? I think you're really a philosopher. You're not really up to the kind of computer science standard. And the philosophers will say, well, you know, you're kind of a computer scientist, aren't you? You're not really kind of up to the standard in philosophy that we want. So, yeah, I didn't get any of those jobs. And I actually found that quite hard to take because I thought of myself as somebody who could do both. You know, I, I can do both philosophy and computer science, whereas they were thinking of me as neither, right? You're, you're neither up to the standard in philosophy nor in computer science. And what I've learned from that is, you know, it's not just about what you know, what you can talk about, what you can think about. It's really what you've got down on paper. Where have you written your ideas up and published them? Are you a published philosopher of the right standard? Are you a published computer scientist or whatever of the right standard? And, and I wasn't. Even, even, even though I had ideas and I'd done work in both sides, I hadn't really published at the right level in either. So what I learned from that is if you are aiming for an academic career in a certain subject, like let's say I wanted to be an academic philosopher, what I really should have done was focus on publishing philosophy in well-known philosophy journals. That would have been the smart thing to do. 
but for some reason that wasn't what I did. And that's why, I mean, that's one reason why it took me absolutely ages to find the kind of job I wanted in philosophy. My PhD experience. Okay, I had an absolutely great time doing my PhD. The, the atmosphere in the computer science department at Nottingham was absolutely great. There was about eight of us in the, in the cohort, eight students all kind of working on different aspects of computer science. We, we worked in an office together. We got great facilities, went to loads of talks, weekly seminars. I went both to the talks in philosophy and in computer science. So I had a really rich academic environment across these two subjects. I went to a lot of um, conferences and talks all around the country and abroad. I went to a summer school each year abroad. My department paid for that. That was absolutely fantastic. They paid for me to go to conferences in, in Stanford in the US and in New York. And I had the most amazing experience. So before my PhD studies, I'd never been outside Europe. And suddenly I was doing this, this stuff where my department would pay for me to fly to New York, to San Francisco. And I had the most amazing time. I met all these amazing computer scientists, logicians, philosophers, and I could talk to them about their work and about my work. It's kind of nerve wracking presenting at international conferences, but, you know, you kind of learn an awful lot from that kind of slightly stressful environment. And, you know, and you do your talk and then people talk to you about it and you feel like you're a proper academic. Yeah, I had a really, really great experience. It was stressful. It did put a lot of pressure on you. You do have that dip in the middle in, in, in the second year where you think, you know, what is my life about? What am I doing this for? Am I just wasting my life doing this? And, you know, all your friends are doing more, you know, seemingly purposeful things while you're basically still just doing a student stuff, trying to write about stuff that you really can't even explain to anybody else. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I, I'm working on logics for, you know, resource bounded agents. Well, what is that? And why are you doing that? And like, seriously, you're spending three years doing that. Yeah, you have a lot of these issues during your PhD, but uh, you enjoy it, right? So you can stick with it and you get to the other side of it. And I personally felt it was like totally 100% worth it. My PhD thesis. So a couple of you guys were asking, like, what exactly did I do in my thesis? So I don't know if this is going to be interesting to anyone, but let me talk you through it. I promise I'll be really, really quick. OK, so my thesis was called Logics for Resource Bounded Agents. So what is all of that? So there's this area of logic called epistemic logic or doxastic logic. It's the logic of knowledge and belief, right? So you've got sentences like, this person believes this thing, this person knows that thing. You've got sentences like that and you're reasoning about them. What do they entail? How do they kind of relate together logically? And there's this big, big problem in the area called the problem of logical omniscience. Basically, if you do belief with kind of logic, you end up looking like people know all the logical consequences of what they know and they believe all the logical consequences of what they believe. So people are perfectly rational believers and knowers. And that obviously just isn't the case. The problem is, how do you do a logic of knowledge or belief without those crazy consequences? That was the problem that I set out to solve. OK, so how did that shape what I did in my thesis? Let me just talk you through it chapter by chapter. So I start off with an explanation of the problem, epistemic logic and the problem of logical omniscience. So that's one chapter. And then I go through a bunch of responses that are already out there in the literature. And I'm basically saying, here's what this person has, has said as a solution. And here's why I think it doesn't work. And here's another one. And here's why I think it doesn't work. Oh, and look, here's another one. And I don't think this one works either, etc, etc. The third chapter I did was kind of more on philosophy, right? So the philosophy of, of, of belief states. So when you say this person believes this, kind of what are you actually saying? What is the kind of semantic form of that sentence. I don't really know why I did this chapter in my thesis. I think I wanted to put some philosophy in there so it wasn't just logic. So, you know, I put a philosophy chapter in. It didn't really need to be there. It probably didn't flow very well. If I was writing it again, I would probably zap that one. And chapter four, I'm looking at one particular approach to the problem that I think kind of might work. So I go through a few accounts that already exist saying they're not quite right, but they're kind of along the right line. So I'm going to take this approach and develop it into a new one that does work. 
So that's what I do in chapter five. It's like, okay, here's my positive proposal. I'm going to give you a logic that tries to solve this problem. So I'm developing this logic through its semantics. And then in chapter six, I try to work out some proof systems. So if you're doing a logic, you do some semantics, you want to kind of explain the proof systems for it. So axiomatize the logic and talk a little bit about some results about that. So a bit of soundness, a bit of completeness. Since I was in a computer science department, I did some complexity analyses, that kind of thing. Basically just saying, you know, I, I can do some logical results. I can prove some new stuff. That's a good thing to put in a logic thesis. And then chapter seven, this was a kind of a, here's something to add to the end. You know, I've developed this logic. It's quite nice, but here's some ways of extending it, taking it further, doing a few more fancy things with it. Okay. So chapters five and six were like, here's my approach. Chapter seven was doing a bit more fancy stuff with it. So roughly half of that thesis is going over old stuff and commenting on it. Here's what the literature looks like. Here's why I think the problem still exists. Here's why we need some new literature on it. Here's my own account. This, this appeared about halfway through. And then from around the midpoint, chapter five, I'm presenting my own account. I'm developing it. I'm proving some stuff about it. And then in the last chapter, I'm just kind of like teasing out some threads of it and saying, oh, you could add this bit. You could add that bit just to kind of show what you can do with it. Okay, so look, I'm not saying that's the ideal structure for a thesis. In fact, I'm saying definitely it's not the perfect structure for a thesis. In this video up here, I talk about what I think is a good way of putting together a thesis. I think this one, I was going to tell you that it's a completely bad approach to doing a thesis, but having looked through it again just now, I think it's not totally bad. It's not the best structure that you could do for a thesis, but it's not bad either. And, you know, looking through it again now, I haven't looked at this for like maybe 15 years or something. I actually think, yeah, I put this together reasonably well. I'm kind of proud of what I did. I basically had a load of work that I wanted to get in there somewhere. So I'm, I, you know, I kind of put it all in there. That's not the best way to structure a piece of work, but I'm, you know, I'm proud of what I did after my PhD. OK, so I handed in my PhD thesis. It was examined. It passed. And then I was on the job market looking for a job. And this is kind of where the shine went off the experience. I just didn't appreciate at the time how difficult it was going to be to get a job. So I've made a video on just how difficult it is to go about getting a job in academia, in philosophy in particular. That's uh, linked up here somewhere. So I'm not going to go on about it now. But in my experience, it was just a nasty time of my life. It took me four or five years from the time I handed in my PhD and passed that to when I've got the job I've got now. And in that time, I did a whole bunch of jobs that, you know, they were really difficult. They were really insecure. They were temporary jobs. So I had no idea where I'd be or what I would be doing in the next like six months or whatever. That didn't put me in a particularly good frame of mind. And what it did mean was that, you know, life was difficult. So I couldn't focus on my research. So Here's where I was at the time I finished my PhD. And a couple of years later, academically, I was basically still there because I was putting all my time into applying for jobs, teaching and basically stressing and not being in a very good mental position. So, you know, during those couple of years after my PhD, I didn't really progress academically until I got offered a postdoc in Sydney, Australia, Macquarie University. That was an absolutely ideal place to do a postdoc, um, you know, three years just spent focusing on research. That was what really helped me to go from someone who's done a PhD in two different subjects and I'm not quite up to standard in philosophy or computer science or, or whatever. So I, I did my postdoc in philosophy and logic and that enabled me to get my research to where it needed to be in order to be seriously applying for proper lecturing jobs. And in the end, I got lucky. I got a job back in Nottingham. So that's where I am now. What are my reflections on that experience? So I've kind of been highlighting here how I did things in a pretty unusual way. You know, I don't think this is the standard way of doing a PhD, you know, jumping straight in from the undergrad and changing subject and then kind of trying to have one foot in each area, philosophy and computer science. Do I wish I'd done it differently? Not really, because you know, when you go through a really challenging time academically, it kind of, it's difficult at the time. And maybe you, for a few years after, you're like, I've really, you know, done a bad thing here. But where I am now, I'm really glad that I had all those difficult experiences. It's made me quite uh, an independent researcher. I know lots about different areas of academia, you know, not just philosophy, but also logic and maths and computer science. And that helps me in my day to day research. And, you know, that experience of, I guess, like struggling and being in a bad place 
kind of helps me out now. It gives me a bit of perspective. So when things aren't going great now, I kind of, I think I have a bit more perspective on that. So, you know, if I could do it all over again, I, I probably wouldn't change it, but I'm not recommending that kind of way of going about it to you, right? So yeah, you know, don't make your life difficult on purpose because it will get difficult enough of its own accord. What I would suggest is talk to your lecturers, listen to their advice. I probably didn't do this very much at all. If you're thinking about doing a PhD in a particular place, talk to potential supervisors there. Your supervisor is probably the most important aspect of your PhD. I've talked about that in a video here. Make sure you talk to them in advance, get to know them and basically check that that's going to work out for you. I guess that's my number one piece of advice if you're thinking of doing a PhD. OK, guys, so that has been a lot of me talking about me. I hope you found it, you know, somewhat useful or interesting. If you have, if you've enjoyed it, give this video a thumbs up. That really helps me out on YouTube. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'm going to be making more videos about PhD study. I would love it if you came back for those. Thank you so much for watching. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment below. I'm going to try and answer all of them. OK, I hope to see you back here soon.